reaction to the footage. Um, but anyway, we we played it as a um, we just played it as a test in the uh, in the gallery space to see what it would look like on a projector. And it was in, it was in, incredibly intense. Obviously, it was as if the the incredible amount of energy that's contained in that lightning was kind of transmitted by the screen to us in a really visceral way. I remember I think there were about five of us five of us in the space watching it and when it ended we were all just um i wouldn't say shaking but we were rocked by what we saw and i'd never played it i'd only seen it on my laptop really i was just editing it on my laptop screen so i've never seen it at that scale and i've never seen it with the sound and um anyway and it was a kind of eureka moment because we realized that this was a this could be a really powerful work um and I think what I'd like to say to lead into the discussion that we're going to have is that I think what's really interesting about the lightning strike in particular is very rare a lightning strike. You know, I don't know if anybody watching has ever tried to capture a lightning strike on their cameras, but it's 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 difficult to do, and it's uh, unless you've got unless you're you've got your camera on a tripod on on a long exposure it's unlikely that you're going to catch it or you've got to, you, you're filming for a long time but what the internet does and what i think what i think our screens do what the internet does what all of this technology does is it collapses everything into very kind of concentrated um uh, how can i say kernels a, a very dense um masses of, of data and information and visual material as well and i think that applies to fear and anxiety as well i think it, it the technology manages to to take things that are very remote to us that have no proximity to us whatsoever and they manage to kind of embed themselves in in, in our in our heads in our bodies all of these fears and anxieties and so uh i think what what i what really struck me about the lightning it was was that that you know it's such a rare uh, event that anybody would film it but obviously online there are thousands of, of videos of people ha who happen to have captured a lightning strike and that's because the phones are on all the time the cameras are always on they're always working and I think, in a sense, the 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 camera operators are maybe not even aware that they are um, the kind of the operator of the camera. It's as if the the camera has its own life, and the the human holding it is just a is just a a host, you know, for the camera. The camera is always on. It's always working. Like this, these cameras are on now, right? Um, and we're we're performing for them in a sense. Um, so um, yeah, so I think when when you when you take natural catastrophe um, and think of it in that context, I think it's quite interesting because you realise how constructive it is in a sense. Yes, there's a, there's science, of course, there's science, but there's something else as well, which I would say is a psychological, a psychic kind of. Um, anxiety and fear that is turned up to 11 and um, and you know thrown at us every day um, but um, yeah so I think so a lot of my work I mean I made a piece called landfall um, a few years ago which uh, should I talk about that should I show that quickly Jacob yeah do it go ahead um, so let's see hang on this isn't i'm doing wow this is trippy <laughs> this is the switch okay. i'm gonna say let me it's gone full screen switch there we go right okay so this is a piece i did um i can't remember the year now let me see 2018 i think 2018 landfall 
So this is these uh, are um, day screen. Is it working? Yeah, yeah. See it. So I collect. I, I basically collected um, uh, footage around catastrophic hurricanes, North Atlantic retired hurricanes. When a, when a hurricane is so devastating that it causes millions of uh, or billions of dollars worth of damage or hundreds of lives lost, lives lost, they retire the name. So there'll never be another Hurricane Katrina, there'll never be a Hurricane Dennis again. Um, and um, so I took a sat satellite image, a high-res satellite image of the satellite and had that printed on a record. And then on the record um, had uh, the audio of relating to, the, to each hurricane kind of uh, on, on, on the vinyl. So, for example, this is Hurricane Fabian. I'll play you a 30 second excerpt of Hurricane Fabian in 2003. It's, um, it was a, uh, a hurricane, a devastating hurricane that hit the Caribbean. And um, what you're going to hear is uh, a radio caught phone in of somebody in his house. Um, while the hurricane strikes, and I'll just play you a 30-second uh, extract of that. And he's calling, uh, he's calling into a radio show to describe to them what, what's happening. The wind's blowing off at the gate. This I have a head a rod paperboard to the bed. The up against the door, and I have a washer and dryer jamming it up against the doorway to stop it from the wind and the debris from blowing the house. So uh, you can see more of that project on my list, but it's, there's all sorts of, I think what, what was interesting for me about that project is realizing how, um, how, how a culture in this case, uh, United States, all the different ways in which a culture represents a phenomenon like the hurricane. So that was a um, that was a radio phone in. There are there are also uh, news reporters that go out into the field and 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 they're there in the path of the hurricane. There are storm chasers who get in their cars and chase after hurricanes and upload the footage on YouTube. There are Associated Press reports, uh, weather channels. Of course. So, in a sense, the landfall becomes a kind of arch becomes an archive of all the different ways in which uh, a culture represents this kind of catastrophic natural phenomenon. I think. I mean, I've, I've only just thought of this, but I guess when we think of when we look back in history, you know, we have you know we have very little to go off in in terms of how cultures perceived um, natural phenomenon, like thunder. I mean, we know that the Greeks, for example, invented gods uh, in order to, you know, that to the Greeks, the gods, the myths that they created help them understand um, these natural phenomena. But we don't have, we have no gods. What we have is this kind of excessive surplus of cultural production and, re and representation of these phenomena. And I guess in a sense, um, that's how I think of, of these works as kind of uh, archives or hieroglyphics in a way to either a future um, audience that might wonder how we, um, how we perceived and represented and, ex and understood these natural phenomena that have been happening for millions of years, let's face it. This, this idea of the archive is really interesting. This idea of like, where, where do these like repositories of this kind of like uh, a digital detritus of natural disaster, like where do they end up and how, how do you, how do you find them? Um, and, you know, the internet is often spoken about as, as this archive, as this like quite problematic, quite like fragile archive, but like, Perhaps the most comprehensive archive that we've ever developed. Um, in in thinking about this, like I'm interested in just to kind of go back to, to what we were saying at the start about ways of ways of sort of tapping into this archive and ways of making work that, that uses the internet as a kind of 
use the sort of browse the window as a camera. I'd be interested just for, for people who might want to get into making stuff like this, like technically, how do you do it? How, what, what, what leads you towards these kind of like repositories of, of images or footage or audio? And how do you, how do you scrape that and put, put that together? Well, in one, on, on a really, well, it's pretty, it's pretty simple, really. You need, you need a, a subject of interest. Um, you know, you have a, I almost have, have questions that I'm looking for. I'm not looking for answers. I'm, um, constantly checking if the question, if it's a good question or not, if I'm asking a good question or if the question that the work asks are good questions. Um, that's the first thing. Um, and I think the, the, the richest work for me is the work that never stops asking those questions. You know, it doesn't give answers at all. I don't, I'm not really, you know, art for me isn't about answers, it's about questions. Um, that's the first thing. Technically, um, it's pretty simple, really. I mean, I, having said that, I say it's simple, I probably take it for granted because I grew up with computers, my dad would build computers um, when I was a kid, uh, long before computers were, you know, ubiquitous like they are now. Um, so I always grew up with computers around me. Um, and, you know, there's this brilliant key on PCs, which is what I work with primarily, which is the print screen button. So it's, I think Apple has a different, uh, what is it? Yeah, is it's it? like Command Shift. Three, so. Command Shift three. So, and then now there's all sorts of different screen capture stuff things out there. So you can you can capture a certain window on your screen rather than the full screen. But I've only I've really I only ever really used just a print screen key for that. Otherwise, there's lots of ways you can scrape video material or um, images off sites even when they try to stop that so on Flickr for example um, on Flickr you can just view the source of the, of the page the source page um, and uh, you can find a JPEG link in there to usually a good quality JPEG if that's what you're looking for um, I could I could record the screen I mean there's 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 lots of different ways you could do it technically it's not really the, the challenge isn't the technical aspect it's the formal aspects of it I, that's that's what i struggle with all the time i to, to this still i still struggle with it it's formal formally what do you do with us all this material how do you mm. present it in a way how do you take how do you leave enough in there for it to be compelling but take out all the superfluous stuff so that it doesn't you know just drown out the essence of what you're trying to convey. Yeah, absolutely. This um, this kind of leads on to a question I was going to ask you quite a bit later on, but I think now feels like a good time to do it. And it's a question from Thomas Dukes. Uh, so the question is, when removed from their monitor, how do you, what is lost and what is gained in the translation of these images screen to, for example, like fancy gallery wall or book uh, or uh, like what's what's lost when you kind of like migrate was scraped online what, what gets lost when you move it offline so for example like i know that um artist she she insists that like this work is like a it's never a recording of a screen or it's never a um like a screenshot it's always a live connection where of, of a window where the air was visible so she's so kind of like a you. purist around around the internet you sorry cut, you cut out there just say who says that uh, Olia Lialina, the Russian oh, yeah. net artist, yes. So anytime that she's showing like a, a net-based work, she insists that it's never a screen recording. It's always like a live grab of a, of a browser window because it's important to her that, you know, you're you're experiencing it natively online and that you can also see the address bar. So yeah, I'm interested in what gets lost when you when you repurpose or reposition these images. Yeah, well, that, that's great. Um, and there's, uh, I mean, there's also room for something quite different, which is up to, I think, I mean, I think this is what photography does in almost all of its 
disguises. Photography takes something that exists in one place and immediately translate it into something else, whether it's a negative, whether it's a digital file, that then goes through many, many further steps and iterations before it results in a print. Um, and so I, rather than say what is lost, I mean, for me, it's, it's much more about what is gained, which is, I think, um, that, I mean, art, I think, should, is, is, should be confrontational, it should be um, contemplative in a sense, it should be critical, it should be a space for reflection. And I, for me, that process of trans taking it off the screen, mm. uh, not that, I mean, my, I, I believe my work can exist, should and does exist as much online as it does uh, offline. But I think that you can't you can't talk about taking it offline without talking about the context that's provided by the institutions that present it let's say or the galleries that present it so you know a museum I, I, I don't have to explain the context that a museum provides but you know when people go to a museum to see something they're going for a particular experience and you know i think it's interesting to take material that exists online blow it up mm. big and present it in a in a monumental format it doesn't have to be monumental it can be small and for people to reflect on i mean the thing is I, I i i don't i'm not so interested in people reflecting on the internet with my work i'm not i'm, I'm less interested in the internet as culture and society yeah the internet is a reflection of the culture and the society and um and I want, and my work, I want it, I want my work to be a reflection of the culture and the society that produced it. And I want people to reflect on that, I guess. So, totally. so taking it out off the screen, I think can, can do that. I, think, I mean, I think what you do lose is you lose that immediate feedback that the internet gives you. So I have no problems at all with anybody taking my work um, and doing their own thing with it online. In fact, for me, the work, it, the work really comes alive in a way that it cannot come alive in the gallery space when that happens online. Mm. You know, when you have people making gifts or adding stuff or taking stuff out or even taking the piss or uh, mocking the artist. Uh, for me, all of that is, I love it. It's terrific. Yeah, take, take note, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, go for it. Go for the jugular. I mean, like I said, I mean, I think our artists need feedback. <clears throat> An artwork is only alive when, is only really alive when people feel something towards it, whether that's hatred or love. And the internet gives you both of those, gives a work both of those in, in ample measure. I was on um, Constant Dullart's website once, and he, he had a, a link to his Wikipedia, and he said, please edit. So the first thing I did is I changed his name from Constant Dullart to Domston Cullart, and then forgot about it. And then about a year later, the um, BBC did, a, did an interview with him, and they, they, they did the write-up, and they put his name down as Domston Cullart, the journalist had obviously gone and just, just taken it from Wikipedia, and that's, uh, and that's, the, that's, that's the best edit I've ever made, I think. Um, I want to talk about the, I want to talk about this sense of documenting something that's too big for one perspective to capture. And there's a, our, our conversation we had a couple of weeks ago reminded me of this, this passage from James Bridle's New Dark Age. He says that the philosopher Timmy Mort Timothy Morton calls global warming a hyper object. It's a thing that surrounds us, envelopes and entangles us, but it is literally too big to see in its entirety. Mostly, we perceive hyperobjects through their influence on other things. For example, a melting ice sheet, a dying sea, or the buffeting of a transatlantic flight. Hyperobjects happen everywhere at once, but we can only experience them in the local environment. I guess I was thinking a lot about that when I go. Um, so what, what I'm interested in, what you're doing here is, is you're kind of like tapping into this, this you're, you're recognizing that no one perspective can adequately uh, capture the, the scale of, of the climate. 
uh, and you're kind of tapping into this distributed network of perspectives. When when you're using this approach, do you do you see it as like a, an effective means of capturing the scale of the crisis, or or as something else? Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I, when you talk about the crisis, you see, I mean, again, I would say um, it's hard for me not to think of of the crisis as a constructive thing, right? That is reinforced with um, all sorts of things. I'm not saying it, ex it doesn't exist. I just mean that my interest is in really, is kind of, I guess, in unpacking that. So rather than crisis, what I would say is, um, you know, we have this, um, we, we have this machine that bombards us with information, right? Mm. With images, with sounds, with stories, with terrifying events. Um, but the machine also makes us laugh. Um, you know, it makes us, um, it, it has very visceral effects. Um, and I guess I, you know, I'm interested in it's funny because this machine gives this machine gives us so much. It mm. gives us so much material. We 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 see the world. We see the entire world through these machines. So what happens when you start to work with those machines? Well, in a sense, you you are working with that hyper object. The hyper object becomes a malleable thing because the very source of all of this material is suddenly in your hands right it's yours to play with so, so i think in a sense that that's a feedback loop of a sort do, do you know what i mean yeah kind of yeah yeah i guess it's a bit like you know nanju and pike putting a really powerful magnet on a television on the old style tvs in the 1970s to completely distort the signals that the television was producing right because the magnetic field of magnet would would mess with the um technology of the tv so it would scramble the um it would scramble the, the the signal and i think in a sense i'm i'm, I'm not doing the same thing but i'm working with that very source of, the, of um, this kind of global perspective on stuff that we're getting all the time. I mean, we're not really, we're getting a, a very particular view of it, a channel. We're on, we're, we're on a certain channel. There are other channels. We're on a, let's say we're on a certain channel. And if I'm using everything in that channel as material, then in, in effect, I'm reflecting back that, um, that thing itself. So I, I don't think that the high projects, I think I, I, I understand James is, um, I understand what he's saying, but I, I think it is possible. I think it must be possible to, to conceive of a way of representing this massive, almost unfathomably large stuff in, um, in a coherent form. I mean, I think the TV does that, actually. I think the screen does that. Yeah. Exactly what the screen does. It just... Go on. To a, to, a, to a hyper degree, where it's maybe, you know, the, the reality that we see on screens is nowhere near the same reality that's out there. But we live our reality now. Our realities are lived through these media and this device. question of this question of coherence is really interesting like because and you know the the exit that you just showed that's that's quite an incoherent um sort of like you know tsunami of just like stimulus it's, it's, there's a lot going on and it's it seems to me like this this line of thinking in this piece it's it's more interested in in how people present or understand the climate than it is in like the climate itself so for oh, example, yeah. you know, like that's, you know, although everything that happened in that video took place, although that is a weather phenomenon, like 
that you know this is it's you know that that's not in, that's not indicative or descriptive of the climate at large and i'm interested in like the role that I was, I was hoping you could talk more about like the role that photography plays in how we we can construct these understandings like planetary ruin and climate breakdown so le less about how do we like present it accurately but, but yeah. more like what role does photography play in representing or misrepresenting the, the climate as it is yeah that's really interesting so i would say that in the past we had authors or auteurs right so you would have really skilled um photographers uh are almost artisans you know uh, crafts craftsmen and women who would construct these kind of really tight well-defined narratives mm. right through their camera and they would use photography as a tool for doing that you know there's countless examples um and in fact, in photography today, there's plenty of characters like, you know, Ed Batinsky, um, Sebastian Salgado, Chris Jordan, uh, so many who I, I think use photography in that way, in, in, in a way of creating a really clear narrative on their perspective of, of nature and what, what our civilization has done to nature, right? Mm. But I think I'm interested in that total chaos of incessant, relentless, in, in, a, in a relentless surplus of constant recording of, um, of these events. So, so that there, 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 there's, there is, a, there is no authorship. They're not, they're not. Um, I, there's almost like a, a kind of purity to the act of capturing the phenomenon, rather than imposing a kind of aesthetic onto it. So, what I love about most of that footage is that it looks terrible. It's, it's not aesthetically considered whatsoever, whatsoever. They haven't even put a filter on it. You know, in, uh, Imagine, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's completely unfiltered, and you could put. I mean, Penelope and Brico have made work adding filters to, to this kind of stuff. It, it can be interesting, but I, I love that sort of. You know, there's another, there's another section of uh, footage that we've been gathering, which we'll make a, a film with, which is um, when the camera drops and the, the, the operator runs. So they drop that they don't drop the camera to the floor but they're running with the camera and so the camera is just capturing movement it's so dynamic and visceral again because you can feel the terror in that kind of suspension of aesthetic co um, composition it's as if all bets are off you feel the terror there's no horizon there's only energy dynamic dynamic energy and fear and terror that we can all relate to and it's got nothing to do with what's being captured it's got everything to do with what isn't being captured with that kind of complete loss of control yeah. of the camera and um so you know I, i'm i'm really interested in that i'm interested in in um yeah in that kind of suspension of aesthetic control and composition and in that loss of uh control over the equipment obviously i come i come i come along and i'm taking control of that material i'm uh, i'm looking for it and i'm doing something with it i'm trying to shape it into something but um but the subject is 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 that is what what i'm describing yeah and this this kind of leads on to a question of 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 scale and of magnitude that, that's in, in a lot of your work so like it's so, so for example you see it in feedlots as well so for people who don't know the work feedlots is a um images of the kind of um the damage that like the, the cattle industry in the us like sort of wreaks upon the landscape and it's these massive massive prints of these images that were made from stitching together hundreds of um 
screenshots of publicly available satellite imagery. I'm not sure if it was Google Earth or if it was another. It was a Google Earth. There you go. It was Google Earth. Uh, and the, the result is these, you know, like staggeringly massive detailed prints that show show something that's like very much there. It's you know, it's, it's not hiding. You, you can find it online, but like it's um, it's kind of force comes through the kind of like meticulousness of combining all of these like small individually available snapshots into something that, that tells a story of a wider story of, of damage. Um, so yeah, in thinking about how all these small perspectives or how all these small images add up into something much bigger, could you envisage work like this without the internet as it is today? And are there any other kind of like networks or any other um, systems of, of communication or information that you feel could could also be kind of leveraged to make work like this? Um, well, the short answer is no. I don't think you could make this work without the internet. When when I started making the work 10 years ago, I, I honestly thought that very soon everybody would be making work like this. Mm. Um, and I've had, to, I've had to wait 10 years for, for coronavirus for people to actually start taking this kind of work as a serious, viable alternative to going out in the street with a camera. Um, but to me, this was always um, not only viable, but absolutely necessary to try and evolve the language of photography and art was to use this, this kind of stuff. Um, your question, that was, that was a question about the internet. What was the other one you asked? I was just, I was thinking about like, are there any of the networks that we could use to, to accomplish this? So any other kind of systems that we could work with to gather, um, gather material at the scale well yeah i mean you have you have activist networks i mean on the back of feedlots there was a uh, an american activist journalist called will potter who created a whole campaign to photograph feedlots using drones across mm. the us and i think he raised a ton of money to do that because in the us it was illegal to photograph feedlots uh, the beef industry didn't want consumers to know where their beef came from. So we, unknowingly, I came across a loophole that allowed people to see what feedlots look like. And I was just using the tool that everyone had access to, but nobody was using it mm. in that way. So I think that, again, I mean, I, I, I honestly feel, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm much older now. I don't have as much time on my hands to make this work as I used to, you know, I've got kids and family. Um, and I'm amazed that um, there hasn't been more done. I, f I feel like there's, the feedlots is just one example of a loophole that was out there. It just, it just needed somebody to go and look for it and find it. And, um, and I'm, I'm amazed that there aren't, there aren't more, especially in the field of documentary photography, um, I'm amazed that there aren't more people working like this because to me it feel it seems so obvious. Again, the other thing I should say is when I was starting making work like this, I didn't have the resources or the means to travel around the world photographing this stuff. But I could afford a twenty pound a month internet yeah. line and a basic computer to travel the world in that way. Um, so, you know, I, I would, I would imagine there's, there's so much more, this is just the beginning, um, of what should, should become, uh, I would have thought, uh, a, a, a really kind of standard way of making work. There's something funny about how when, uh, when Google Street View was first rolled out or when Google Earth was first, first rolled out, like the first thing that everyone does is just look at their houses. And there's, there's like, I mean, I, I did it, maybe you did as well. There's, there's something kind of like, uh, it's almost like you're so overwhelmed by like the, the, that by how much is available to you, that you just kind of like back into your little familiar corner and just see if you can see yourself outside your house. Um, uh, cool. I'm going to go out to some questions that we've had from, from other people at the gallery and, and from members of the public as well. Yeah.
Uh, so this is a question from Mariama, our creator. Uh, in working with images found online, are you deliberately trying to exclude the presence or participation of humans on your projects? No, I mean, they, uh, they wouldn't exist without them. So, I mean, even, even the feedlots, I mean, if you think about the technology involved I mean, not just in the feedlot, but in in the optics and in the communication networks and the satellite infrastructure to, that has allowed that has even got us to that point. It's extraordinary. Um, I, I think maybe what she's asking is um, a kind of um, do I exclude? the producers of that material from the work, maybe? Yeah, well, I, I guess there's, there's something interesting there about um, authorship or something interesting about like, the question of the question of ownership or authorship over that footage. Well, I, I, I kind of think of it like a writer, even a fiction writer. So somebody like Margaret Atwood spends years and years, she has teams of people gathering news articles, anecdotes, you know, the most dystopian stuff. And I think she said before that there's nothing in any of her, you know, there's nothing in The Handmaid's Tale, in the novel that she wrote, that didn't happen. Um, everything, everything in that novel has happened somewhere. But what she does is she gathers it all together. She gathers all of this material together, all of this disparate material, and tells a story using that material. And I, I mean, for me, it's the same thing. There's no difference to what I'm doing, really, I feel. I feel like I'm gathering material that's out there and I am shaping it into a new kind of story or a kind of vision, a new kind of vision of the world um, and um, that wouldn't have existed if I hadn't done it. So, um, you know, I feel like... Um, yeah, people are intrinsically involved in in my work. Um, it's just you might not see them. Yeah, this this question of ownership over footage. I think I think so many of the kind of like standard com so many standard conversations or so many, so many of the standard sort of like impulses around around ownership kind of just like collapse online. Like um, you know, like part of the. So, so by that I mean like you know both, both the way that kind of like privacy poly policies of like Instagram and Facebook kind of relinquish ownership over photos as soon as they're shared on their servers it's like a sort of consent that the image is kind of like no longer yours but also the sense that like there's actually something um, you know one one of the reasons the internet is so resilient is that it is distributed and that it's not like it's not like I, I own this image I have this physical print and it's, it's in this box and no matter how how well I put it box would have done or a my house could get run down or I could lose it this whereas like a digital image that's kind of where you've relinquished your kind of control over it is far far more resilient because it can exist in all these different servers around the world so but both from a kind of from a practical perspective but also from a sort of like cultural perspective this idea of um the sort of slipperiness of the boundary and the boundary chip upon line is I think Rich, um, Elizabeth Laura. Um, this kind of harks back to what you were saying before. You said that the screen collapses everything into kernels, into these dense masses. And in having access to an overwhelming amount of visual stimulus, it sets up this problem of how do we manage that? So Liz says, I've heard your practice described as a human filter of data. I'm very aware of the overload of content and time spent online, both pre and post COVID, and how that's heightened right now for everybody. How do you approach this idea of filtering out or down when you're working? And are you yourself able to switch off when the basis of your work is very much about the need to, to search and to scour the online world? So in short, how do you balance your online and offline experience? That's a question for all of us right now. Yeah. Uh, well, I've got two kids, two very young kids, so it's impossible to be online all the time. Um, that's, that's a really simple answer. 
I mean, I live, um, I have a life um, offline as well as online. I think that's, uh, but that's true of everyone. I mean, I don't think I'm any different really to anybody else um, in that sense. But uh, in terms of filtering information and data, I mean, I'll just give you an anecdote, which is uh, I was in uh, visiting my uh, uh, family-in-law in Toronto last summer, and I was sitting, and we, I took the kids to the supermarket, and in the supermarket you could eat, you could have uh, lunch in the supermarket, in a little sit-down area. So I had my two kids in front of me, and I'm eating this meal, and behind them there's a massive screen, and there's this news channel in Canada, it's, it's from 24-7, 24 hours a day, and there's traffic cams, weather, it's all it's permanent, traffic cams, uh, weather reports, and then there's a ticker tape of news uh, running along the bottom. So I'm sitting there in Toronto. I mean, not much happens in Toronto. It's a pretty safe, quiet place, especially in the suburb where I was. And on this ticker tape, I'm trying to I'm trying to have a conversation with my kids, but I can't. Like anybody, I'm my eyes keep going to the screen. And on this ticker tape is a succession of horrors, horrific stories. Man beheaded in in Rio de Janeiro suburb. Um, woman raped, gang raped and murdered in Beijing. Um, catastrophic floods bury school in the Philippines. And it was just this onslaught of catastrophe. And I was sitting there thinking, my God, you know, what, why, first of all, why do I need to know this? O obviously, there's, there's horrible stuff happening all over the world at any one time. But why, what is the impetus for transmitting that relentless ticker tape of horrors? And, um, I guess you know I come I, I come across stuff like that and I think you know what can I what is going on there you know I guess I'm trying to I'm trying to see everything anew in a sense you know I mean I've I've always had a kind of you know I came to England when I was eight you know I'm an immigrant uh, a child of a of a, ref, of a Polish refugee um, in you know from a family of refugees. I mean, I've, I have a kind of outsider's take on the world, and I guess um, to some to, to an extent. So, you know, you 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 kind of you, you you have a I have a need to make something of all this stuff. I can't just accept it. Yeah, for sure. A um, few more questions. We've, we've got about five or ten minutes left. Just uh, for anyone watching, just so you know, we are also chatting on our Discord community. So the link is in the video. Please go ahead and follow that and join, join us in. And once we kind of like wrap up here, we are going to be, be moving that this conversation over to the Discord chat. Uh, so me and Mishka will be there. Chat to us. It'll be fun. I think some of the questions that we can't kind of fit into the stream, we'll, we'll move over there. Uh, so quick question from Deck is, as we, oh, not that quick, but a good one. As we build online spaces and ways of understanding our environment through a continuous stream of image uploads, does the traditional camera become a nostalgic object? Does the photographer's role fall more into a curatorial one rather than an active hunt for new subjects? Well, I think the artist or the uh, photographer is always looking for subjects, compelling subjects. I don't think that's ever going to change. Uh, just like a writer needs um, subject, um, so I, I don't think that will change. I think I think the idea of it's a bit like the idea of an office now seems mm. a bit kind of in this new reality. The idea of an office block seems almost redundant, right? The technology is there, the infrastructure is there to remove the need for offices. Right, because we True, but at, at what psychological cost for people for people at home? Not, not that I'm encouraging we all go back to offices, but I think it's it's interesting yeah, to, but to I see mean, this kind of collapse of like professional and personal space that, that we're seeing. Sure, but we, we we're constantly adapting and changing, aren't we? It's mm -hmm. a relentless 
succession of um, crises and um, res and responses to those crises. Um, and I guess, you know, okay, maybe maybe the office blog is a, is a bad analogy. Let's let's take painting. So what does painting do with the advent of photography? Well, it has to reinvent itself. And um, and for, what does photography do when there are no there is no need for humans anymore to take photographs? Let's say, right? Let's assume that in fifteen years, no human will ever need to actually press a button to take a picture anymore because I don't know who knows where we'll be. Well, I think we can already foresee the age of the um, we can foresee an age in which the idea of a photographer. Uh, traveling the world with a like around their neck might be a redundant one, much like a a painter setting up an easel to paint um, the most the most naturalistic, the most realistic um, image possible. Right? Um, I don't think it's much of a leap to imagine an age that, where photography will be a Will, will have to reinvent itself, and it is reinventing itself. Um, I, I, the other thing I was, the other analogy I was going to say was, um, uh, you know, when the 35 mil camera came out at the beginning of, um, in, in the 1930s, 1940s, it changed everything, right? I mean, the whole visual language of photography completely changed overnight with the 35 mil camera. Suddenly you didn't have to have a camera on a tripod and wait a minute to make an exposure, right? You're suddenly able to make very quick images instantly. Um, and, uh, and the internet will have that same effect. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind, the internet will change everything for, for photography and, and many, many other things as well. Yeah, I think we're already a pretty, pretty long way of along that trajectory as exactly. well. Yeah. It's interesting what you're saying about the uh, no need for humans to, to make images anymore, especially when we think about how like so many of the so many of the images produced so as part of like sort of surveillance infrastructures or as, as like um, training for AI, they're not images that are designed to be seen by humans, nor are they ever seen by humans. But that's that's taking a sort of like quantitative approach to, to photography and an image rather than thinking about how you know, how it's useful for people and then how it, what, what it can accomplish for people. Um, I feel like that is a good point at which we should move this conversation over to our Discord. Uh, so if you're watching, please come join us. The link is the link is there. Just hit that, put that into your browser and it will prompt you to download Discord, do that, and then it will prompt you right into the chat. Um, and I would like to open up this conversation, particularly around this, this idea of um, would the camera ever become a nostalgic object, and what is the uh, what are the kind of new dynamics of photography in in an age where the sort of like the capacity for the gaze is, is so so enhanced and distributed? Uh, Mishka, thank you so much for for chatting. It's been it's been great, and I'll see you up on the Discord. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. Also, um, thank you, Nat, for doing all the all the back end on this. Uh, she's got a video turned up, turned off. But yeah, thank you for, for doing all that. Go on. Me? Yeah, yeah, sorry. You, you oh, no, I'm done. <laughs> Sweet, great, we're done. <laughs> nice one, thank you. Thanks.